From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. What happens when hackers don't pay their suppliers? Well, they go to hackers' court. Salesforce is blaming its crash on a sole employee. And do bug bounties actually help security, or is this the Cobra effect all over again? Well, these are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week's Cybersecurity Headlines podcast. And now we're going to get a chance for some insights, some opinion, and some expertise on these stories and more from our guest, who this week is Jimmy Sanders, who is CISO of Netflix DVD. Jimmy, welcome. Welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here with everybody. Thanks for having me. We're going to get into some stories right away here, but I just want to remind everyone before we start here that our sponsor this week is Sumo Logic. And if you are joining us live, uh, please join us over on Crowdcast and uh, share your comments and some thoughts. We love to hear what you have to say, and we can even uh, acknowledge some of them on the show if we can. So, Jimmy, we've got just about 20 minutes now to uh, talk about a few things that we've been covering on the, uh, the Cybersecurity Headlines podcast. Number one here is that uh, the Air India hack. India's been having a, uh, Indian companies have been having a hard time recently with some of their, uh, their breach issues. And this is a hack that <clears throat> covers 10 years and, and at least three other airlines in terms of um, not actually being attributed to Air India specifically. It was actually directed at CETA, which is a passenger service system based in Geneva. Um, it happened in February, and it gave attackers access to about 10 years' worth of data, including names and passport and credit card information from Air India, Singapore Airlines, New Zealand Air, and Lufthansa, which is about 4.5 million people. Now, my question to you is this. CETA disclosed this three months ago, but Air India only disclosed this just very recently, uh, which is um, a question to me in terms of You've got a kind of a supply chain going on here. You've got a, a hub, basically, with CETA at the center. Do you think that, in general, hub organizations like this should have an obligation to maybe push some of its slower members into full disclosure? I mean, should they be owning this problem a little bit more? Yes, they should be owning the problem more, but it all just depends on your contractual obligations and your legal requirements. India may have a, a totally different disclosure policy than, let's say, New Zealand or of Switzerland so, or Geneva. So um, that's a touchy subject. But if you're the consumer, you want to know as soon as possible. Indeed. Yes, absolutely. So perhaps even if it's not um, entirely uh, litigious or within the actual legal systems, perhaps a, a, a professional moral obligation to, to push. Maybe they did. I, I know that the uh, Air India's... I have yet to see a professional moral obligation actually bear fruit. <laughs> When I hear professional, I hear make money. Okay, right on. So, uh, yeah, so we've got a, a substantial conflict of interest perhaps going on here. And I mean, you know, it may indeed be that they were trying. I know that Air India is having some challenges financially as well. But it just seems to be that when you've got this, we're seeing more and more, of course, the interrelationship with, with companies, with organizations, just like in the supply chain, just like the infrastructure we have with oil and electricity. They're, they're, not, they're not islands. And so... Maybe there is uh, some some moral obligation, some moral um, requirement to do that. So we shall see, of course. Um, here's another one that I think is quite fascinating in terms of the evolution of our industry. The dark side is getting taken to hackers' court for not paying its affiliates. Now, dark side is known, of course, for being responsible, uh, suspected anyway, for the colonial pipeline attack. But some of the people who've been working for them are not getting paid. And so they've taken dark side to a hacker's court, a kind of a people's court for organizations where they're not necessarily suing for compensation monetarily wise, but perhaps putting the organization's reputation on the line to to maybe stop them from getting other good business. So to me, this puts the organized in organized crime. So do you think we're entering an age now where this kind of thing is going to maybe bleed out? For example, insurance companies are going to now rate their insurance coverage based on the ratings of the cyber criminal organizations. Are we seeing sort of an increasing sophistication on the, the dark side of our, our business? I don't think we're seeing an increasing sophistication. I think we see a more illuminating side of the, of the dark side of the security realm. There has been organized underground hacking ever since the frack days of the 1980s, early 90s. Uh, we just didn't get illuminated about it because we, we were kept out of that environment. But now that you have nation state attackers that are getting publicly endorsed by their nations, it's gaining more visibility. It's incredible. It's fascinating. So 
let's look at one that we've known for many years as a, um, a, a staple of our industry, which is Salesforce. They had a crash earlier this month, which uh, they ended up blaming uh, a sole employee for using an emergency patch. Now, the backstory for this is that uh, uh, they were doing an up- update, a DNS configuration change. And, and um, this individual, who I believe was based in Australia, Rather than using a staggered rollout, um, he or she decided to shortcut the normal procedures by using an emergency brake fix, which required that the DNS servers themselves get restarted, but they were actually needed for the rollout. So they got into a circular dependency, which took a while to fix. Now, the uh, organization said, you know, we're back up uh, and we have taken the appropriate action with the employee. So... Obviously, Jimmy, I mean, people do make mistakes, but is this, I mean, forgive my ignorance perhaps on this, but should there not be greater safety protocols for something this large? I mean, Microsoft does this. They all have some little slips once in a while. Google pushes out things, but this seemed pretty big. Uh, Does this sound like just throwing the intern under the bus or is this uh, the normal risk of upgrades? It definitely sounds like you threw the intern under the bus. Who orchestrated this environment to not allow layers of controls that would mitigate against this circumstance? If you didn't gamify this, or you didn't do threat model behind this, it's not the intern's fault. It's like security always blaming the end user when we make a mistake in building our security protocols. Yeah, and I mean, it, it may not have exactly been an intern this time. However, I'm just thinking back to, hmm, SolarWinds. Uh, <laughs> these things do get uh, mentioned that time. It's just very easy to, to do that. Now, I mean, Salesforce is highly respected as an organization, and it's much, much bigger than the CRM that it used to be. So maybe live and learn, but it just seems to be an eyebrow raiser given how much importance uh, Salesforce has on the, the global infrastructure. Um, that and I have the utmost respect for the Salesforce security team and the way they develop things, mm-hmm. but to think that a single entity can take down an entire billion dollar organization is a little far-fetched. Yeah, it, it really is a little scary because even if it's just for a few hours, there's a lot of stuff that happens in that time. Um, just wanted to also acknowledge a comment coming in as we're uh, working here together. David Beach is uh, raising an eyebrow or two about why criminals in the in the dark side are not uh, honoring their contractual obligations. I mean, hey, who knew? Um, very good comment. Absolutely. But you know what? You can- That is a good comment. But the way it works for every industry that you're in is you're peer reviewed. So you get recommended based on your consistent behavior, whether you're a criminal or you're a good person. You won't get references for future contracts. So if you only want to make that one pop that they did, let's say the Colonial Pipeline, then that's good for them and they'll never get references again. But uh, it's it's uh, we had this discussion actually last week, honor among thieves. You know, there is this is a business. And uh, one of our headlines from today was talking about, oh, my goodness, which one was it that's just um, made a, 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 a billion dollars, I think it was, last year. I mean, in, in terms of dark side type business, it, it's a very profitable business. So you've got good people running it and you've got smart people organizing it. So yeah, I would expect some degree of this kind of rating system going on. So um, once in a while, we we encounter a story which is, a, a, again, just about um, the 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 bumping up, basically, between countries and big social. And we've got another one right now, which is that Russia has been threatening to slow and throttle Google. Uh, it did this with Twitter a while back after uh, Twitter refused to delete some banned content, and now it's threatening some action against Google. Uh, this is what it construes to be illegal information, and saying that Google could also be fined up to 10% of the company's total annual revenue for repeat violation. I'm not quite sure if that's just the Russian rev um, revenue or its global revenue. Uh, but Russia basically wants to 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 turn the turn the screws here on Google for information that it doesn't like. And again, we've seen this with India and other countries as well. So we're seeing social media giants butting up against nation governments. Um, so who benefits more? If you think about it from your experience perspective, who is the main beneficiary? Does a country benefit better from having a thriving social media or does social media benefit from being having access to a country's people? Or is it sort of a half and half type deal? I would say social media benefits okay. because social media without our consent has been scraping our data, using it to profile us, doing things of that nature, where governments may be looking out for our best interest. Well, in this case, they may or may not be looking out for our best interest, but it will definitely hurt s- social media than it will a country like a Russia or India. OK, so we, we do have a clear side, a clear winner then. Okay, very cool. Not a not a clear winner, but you have 
because you're your own foreign, your own sovereign entity, you're able to dictate the controls that happen within your borders. Right. So, so that is the yeah, be, being sovereign in the full full uh, sc- uh, scope of the term. It's just very. Um, uh, it seems to be continuing to grow in terms of of the budding heads of of uh, what once there was an innocent time when Facebook was just simply Facebook, and now these these are organizations that have enormous power. And so again, we're seeing these things grow. What I, what I'm seeing is the more money you see things make, the more you want to see governments get involved. When the internet was still in its infancy, nobody heard about taxes on goods and things. But as soon as it became a billion dollar, trillion dollar industry, oh, government perks up. Right, right. Yes, well, that does sound like uh, par for the course for uh, for them. To have a look at our sponsor for this week, which is Sumo Logic. Sumo Logic. It is time to rethink your security for digital transformation success. So why not register for Sumo Logic's modern SOC Summit, which is happening June 8th and 9th, to debate, discuss, and share best practices for modernizing security operations for the rapidly evolving threat landscape. Reserve your spot for this virtual event at sumologic.com and click on the top of the screen and all the details are there. DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, is to issue its first ever cybersecurity regulations for the pipeline industry after the colonial hack. This is something that is uh, beginnings of a regulation in cybersecurity in this industry for the first time, and perhaps it might expand into other infrastructure industries as well. Uh, It's going to require pipeline companies to report cyber uh, incidents back to federal authorities, and uh, there'll be some mandatory rules as to how pipeline companies must safeguard their systems against cyber attacks. Now, question once again. This puts uh, sort of a kind of a political spin on here because we've got obviously a Democrat led administration uh, face to face with an industry that has benefited greatly from years of assistance, uh, basically with uh, previous administrations that were oil friendly and resistance to regulation. So do you think that these this particular initiative is going to have any long term teeth or might the organizations kind of just tread water until the next election, whatever happens there? Unfortunately, I don't think it'll have long term teeth and it has a bad peripheral ap- appearance to it because to single out an individual industry instead of be- coming out with a comprehensive guideline for all critical infrastructure, instead of just saying the pipeline industry, it would have looked a lot better if they would have said critical infrastructure. Here's the rules of engagement. Yeah. And that's a, obviously a very, very large uh, area to, to work with. Um, and so. With this, again, being a federal initiative, how, how much power might it have on a state level? I mean, does it always automatically overrule any state initiatives or is this going to be 50 slash 51 different opinions playing out? This is a legal battle because, as you said before, it's, it was initiated by a Democratic elected federal government. But you may have a Republican state government that says, nope, we're protecting our oil industry. We're protecting our pipelines. We will sue to block these rules. So to me, this is set up for a perfect court battle. Yeah, which it, it, that's that's what it sounded like to me is that it, the, in, it, the idea is wonderful. And I'd, I'd love to see it just simply because we, we're, we're getting very sobered up as to the the nature of the connectivity of these kinds of infrastructure applications. You know, one goes down like like Colonial did, and you sort of close down the eastern seaboard for a few days. Uh, that's... But we've been... But we've been arguing about this for the last 20 years. The ICS, you know, industrial, you know, industrial, you know, complex and all of the interconnected systems. We've been talking about this for years. And for it to be bearing fruit now, it's, it's almost like when we were warning about, you know, a pandemic effect and then COVID hit. It's like shouting in the wind. <laughs> right. It's, it, it's a huge challenge. Absolutely. And you've got a lot of, lot of people, again, with vested interests, politically or financially, that uh, are going to fight this or push it. I'm getting a comment here from Rick Woodward. I just want to read it here. Um, I'd expect something like NERC CIP to pivot from energy to pipelines. Um, interesting comment. Do you have any uh, a take on that? Unfortunately, I don't know what NERC CIP is. So I apologize, Rick. That's, that's a, a nuclear, I believe. It's the, the um, okay. uh, nuclear power regulator. So uh, it may be, and, and maybe Rick wants to, to, to um, add some more to the comment to see, but it looks like it may be um, that perhaps they could uh, pivot that way to, to overseeing it and, and ruling it. Uh, I'd love to hear more. But, but 
But my point, once again, is don't do a laser focused security. Don't only protect the pipeline industry and leave everything else out in the wind. Because as we've seen before, if it's not the pipeline industry that's getting attacked, it could be the wind farm industry. It could be your water supply. Everything is interconnected. Absolutely. It's just the same thing as just typical endpoints, really. I mean, it's, it's those hidden parts that are, uh, uh, again, that hold the connections together, which may become the weak parts. Thank you, Rick, for that. So going down to something a little bit more local, uh, we picked up on a story which was written by uh, a company that does actually manufacture keyboards and mice, as, as sort of full disclosure here, but that's not an issue at all because we deal with people all the time who make stuff for this business. But uh, Dale Ludwig was a writer who said that the smart keyboards might be the next frontier against insider threats. Um, he's looking at keyboards that have a particular kind of security in terms of uh, smart cards that, that uh, allow them to get access. Um, this could be uh, two-factor authentication using these smart cards or contactless card readers, and maybe even being partnered with new mouse technology for sort of uh, recognizing somebody's fingerprints by actually using the mouse. So. Is this, uh, again, is this a new idea? Has this been around for a while and rejected? Is it worth a second look right now with better technologies? Uh, is it an aha moment? Like, yeah, that's a really great um, interstitial part of the security chain. What do you think about keyboards and mice in this role? We've, we've tried this same thing when Microsoft integrated or tried to do their trusted, the TPM model where they would take snapshots of your RAM and and check out your you know, CPU and make sure that everything was secure upon boot. We've tried this time and time again. The problem with smart keyboards and smart mouse is that you're gonna go to every laptop manufacturer because who's using desktops anymore? So that means you need agreements with Lenovo, with Apple to build these keyboards or your company goes out and buys a whole bunch of keyboards that nobody wants. That logistical nightmare. Again, you've also got the retro effect. I mean, if you have a, a computer that you're still using for a few years, it'd be a long uh, switch over before it became active. But, um, you know, it's food for thought, perhaps. Uh, you know, many other things like cameras have been installed on computers that, that slowly grow into it. Uh, so it, it's possible it could get phased in. But if you're thinking that it wouldn't be a, a, a practical component, uh, it could it get overruled? It, it is possible that it could get phased in, but the thing about a camera is that we have several different camera man manufacturers and several different specs. When you talk about smart keyboards that have specific security requirements, that's a totally different, you have to have a whole template and regulations behind it. Ah, very, very good. Yes. Uh, again, I think that uh, this this was perhaps a food for thought article, but uh, it's just interesting to see a new piece come out from, from left field and perhaps that could be uh, discussed. But that, those are really excellent, salient points. So let's talk about bug bounties. Do bug bounties actually help security? This is another editorial we picked up uh, from Dark Reading saying, you know, are bug bounties similar to what was called the Cobra effect in India, where under a British colonial rule many years ago, uh, a bounty on actual physical cobra snakes uh, to reduce their population resulted in residents actively breeding them to cash in. And I've heard many stories like this, uh, even in the States with, with horses and so on. Uh, so even though bug bounties can be bred in exactly the same way, uh, the writer was considering whether bug bounties are just a way for vendors to transfer the liability of eliminating vulnerabilities in their products to bug hunters rather than doing the extensive secure design uh, development and testing. So it's not that there's not a role for bug bounties, he was saying, but rather than if you without addressing the source that creates these, they may not be effective in reducing their numbers. So bottom line question for you, Jimmy, is this something that is uh, worth sticking with? Do bug bounties still work? Are they a valuable part of our our ecosystem? Bug bounties do work, but it depends. To me, are you building your castle or is your castle already built? If you're working on building your castle and what's the use in having a bug bounty when you already know you need to build a moat, when you already know you need to build the walls. But if you think you have a hardened castle, you have a hard moat, then yes, a bug bounty will go and test your defenses because then you want to know, is my security adequate? So if you're building your security, no, don't do a bug bounty. But if you but if you're working on your security, yes, because an attacker won't wait for permission. You're getting attacked right now all the time by attackers, and, and they don't tell you about it. At least with a bug bounty, they'll at least tell you about the vulnerabilities that they find. Right. So, okay, so there's a great place for it then. That's, that's a wonderful analogy, by the way. I really like that. Um, we also got from uh, our producer, Andrew, here that NERC, CIP, just for your knowledge, is the guiding regulation for the energy industry. So there we go. Live and learn. And Yes, I know I'd heard it before, uh, but sometimes some of these acronyms can uh, trip over themselves or they can be confused with other ones. So, you know what? Our time is up already. I mean, I'm having such fun with you and it's just like 
passed by so quickly. So looking back over the stories that we've had, uh, is there any here that were the most fun for you, the thumbs up, or maybe even an eye roller as to here we go, here we go again? I, I love the dark side getting taken to Hacker's Court one and the smart keyboards because the smart keyboards does enlighten you for conversation. But to me, the dark side one, you know, is, was the That's great. the thing. Okay. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, I mean, this has been uh, an absolute delight, and I um, had such fun. Uh, your wisdom is is just really uh, enlightening with your analogies. I just love that so much. So, uh, Jimmy Sanders, CISO of Netflix DVD, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, I really appreciate it. It was great to be here with you. It's a great pleasure. Take care. Thank you. So here we are at the conclusion of another one. And uh, I want to thank also our sponsor, Sumo Logic, for bringing the show to you today. Uh, just a reminder that there will be no Friday video chat tomorrow. Usually we have one on Fridays, but in um, reference to Memorial Weekend, Memorial Day weekend, uh, there will be no video chat tomorrow. But on June 4th, come back, we'll be doing hacking DLP, data loss prevention, and how we can manage data loss when everybody is working from home, which is still, of course, as always, a very vital component component of our life right now and will be for a while as well. So I just want to say thank you for dropping in, for you guys dropping in to see us here. And uh, we will be back again next week. Uh, in the meantime, check us out every day for our six-minute podcast, Cybersecurity Headlines, so you can learn what you need to know every day of the week. Till next week, I'll see you then. Thanks for being here. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.